Good morning, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. Looks like we got a couple folks in here already. SQL Pilot, James, Black Lotus, good to see you again. Uh, so uh, this is, of course, the stream. Oh, SQL Dev DBA, the stream where uh, y'all can post questions over in PollGab over at the URL over in the top right. And then I go through the top voted and usually hit some of the new questions that have come in uh, as well. I am waiting for a uh, service tech to get here. I uh, had to order a replacement windshield for my Land Rover Defender. <laughs> Nova says you come here often. As a matter of fact, I do. Uh, my Land Rover Defender, we did a road trip uh, to like Orange County this past weekend for uh, SQL Saturday Orange County. It was the first one they've had since the pandemic, which is really nice. Um, so drove over there for that. And then uh, on the way back, got a rock chip in the windshield and it spread like like a foot across in no time. Uh, it was just like, even in the span of like half an hour, you know, I think it was just... And uh, the dealer can't get one for months, so it's kind of weird. So we're, I'm waiting for Safe Light to come by and drop one off. Surrogates, uh, welcome to the stream. The Kazik, hello as well. Boy, all kinds of people in here uh, today. So let's see what the uh, top voted question is. The top voted question that we have says from Guaro SQL, is it necessary to enable ADR in SQL Server 2019 for row versioning to work better, or is it optional? It's just totally optional. The problem with turning on accelerated data recovery uh, is that then the, the versions are now in your user database, which means that instead of tempdb blowing up, which is kind of a shared space for everyone, gives you some, some wiggle room there, depending on which database is using transactions or versions, ADR grows each of the databases to accommodate their versions. Um, so you can end up with more disk space used overall, and it's inside your user databases, which can present some problems for restoring into development and QA environments. I am by no means saying that ADR is a bad feature. It's really cool, especially in the way that it allows you to do instant rollbacks. But I wouldn't go about uh, turning it on just to think that things are magically going to get better. I always say, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And that definitely rings true here. What's the problem you're having that users are complaining about that makes you want to go start pushing buttons? Uh, next up, Rojo asks, if I'm upgrading a major version, like from SQL Server 2016 to 2019, and I build a brand new install, can I simply detach the old database and attach it to a new one? I'm trying to save time on a big database. What you do when you're trying to save time is go build a brand new SQL Server with the version that you want and start log shipping over to it. You can either use log shipping, database mirroring, always on availability groups. My personal favorite is log shipping just because it works really well with the two different versions there. And then when it's time to fail over, you simply back up the tail of the log on your 2016 box, seals the database into read only, and that makes sure that you got every single transaction. Then you restore the tail of the log over on the new 2019 box so you can go live, especially Especially if you script this stuff ahead of time, you can go live in a matter of seconds. Pro tip, also use a DNS pointer so that you can uh, point the old server's name over to the new server. Uh, hey Shane, Spitfire, uh, welcome into the chat as well. Um, next up, Nestra says, why are views sometimes much slower than the same query executed directly, and what can be done to make them equally fast? I'm going to rephrase your question is, why is the same query sometimes perform differently depending on where you call it from? And what I'd really say is we're probably looking at other differences in the query, like in things that surround it. It can perhaps be a parameter sniffing issue. It can perhaps be other things in the query that you're doing it, like loading data into a temp table or a table variable. You really want to compare the two execution plans side by side to start to understand what the differences are. All things being equal, the same query, whether it's run in plain T-SQL, in SSMS, inside a view, inside a stored procedure, makes no difference to SQL Server. It's all about the context of what else is going on. Good morning, BMC means. 
Um, my T got cold says, do you know any good mailing list for peer reviewing large writings about SQL Server? I'm going to give you an answer that's that's going to kind of surprise you. You don't forget a mailing list. You're not going to find one of those that it's, that's going to do what you're after for SQL Server. What I would probably do is approach the website Simple Talk. Simple Talk uh, sell. I don't want to say sells. They buy uh, large writings about SQL Server, and they have an editorial team that will help you with your English, your technical wording. They'll peer review the contents. Um, it's it's perhaps one of the most technically accurate sites out there. I'm not saying every article is perfect, uh, but if you want help from professional reviewers, that's the place that I would start. Uh, Bonnie asks, did you experience a near total eclipse? I did not. Uh, I was uh, in Las Vegas, wasn't in the stream of totality, total, wasn't in the strip path of the total eclipse. A uh, Jokel says, what are your thoughts on remoting into the production SQL server to run Management Studio? We have several power users who like to do this. What's the best way to deal with it? The way that I deal with it is usually users want a desktop that's going to be reliable because they're probably going to try and run a really large query that takes a long time, and they don't want to worry about their desktop or laptop disconnecting. So the solution is to give them something called a jump box, a VM that lives in your production data center, lives near the SQL server, uh, is up 24-7, and then that way people can remote desktop into that and run whatever tasks that they need will, that will take a long time so that then they can disconnect their laptop, go home for the night, open the laptop again, check on the status of it by remote uh, remoting into their jump box. Jump boxes are very common techniques out in enterprises. You can learn more about that by Googling uh, jump box. I've got posts on them too. If you Google for jump box, SQL Server, Brenos are. I've got posts explaining why you want them and how they uh, do you some good. Hi, Stillgart. Uh, next up, we have Credit says, recently a table with wrong data uh, caused the business to go down for a few hours. We plan to create a trigger to see who is behind these. Uh, someone prefers creating dynamic triggers. Da, 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 da. Was a dynamic trigger the best option? If your goal is to see who's doing something, use auditing. SQL Server's auditing is, generally speaking, going to be higher performance than the triggers that you're going to write under duress, like the triggers that you're going to try to write really quickly. I'm a huge fan of triggers. I would just say that if, you're, if your goal is to catch who's doing something, that's what auditing is all about. The Kazakh says, I, he remembers laughing when I said on a video that I bet people are watching this on production SQL servers. I totally have seen that happen uh, because one, one of my uh, folks said that the only way that they could watch YouTube was to remote into the production data center because that was the only place where they could access the internet without filters. And I got a huge laugh out of that. Uh, Gareth asks, how do you change the culture so that a production DBA role is less reactive and more proactive? You know, it's, it's a good idea, and everybody wants to do it. What it generally boils down to is time. That A lot of database administrators are understaffed. They don't have enough people uh, to become proactive. So it's something that has to come down from management. Because essentially, proactive means you have the time to go poke around in things and go do preventative work. Well, if that's going to be the case, then you, you can't have a big queue of tickets that you have to go solve, which means you need more person power. So it's more of a management thing than a, a personnel decision. So that's why you see a lot of people stuck in the older roles, in the reactive roles. Uh, Jokel asks, many users have permissions on the production box server to create agent jobs. How do you track down who to content when one of these jobs starts to fail? My personal preference for that is that I make the agent job has to start with the name of the group that's responsible. So like DBA underscore, and then all your index rebuild jobs, your backup jobs, whatever. BI underscore ETL means it's the ETL team out of BI. And patrol on a regular basis, just have, you can, for example, set up scripts that whenever an agent job is created, there's an alert that goes out via database mail. Any uh, job that's created that doesn't match your naming standards, that doesn't have the team attached, simply delete it. And when the person comes in and says, why did my agent job go away? 
there's your answer. You go, okay, great. Now I'm going to coach you on how to write agent jobs here. We have the standard that that has to start with the uh, team. Uh, SQL Dev DBA says he loves that approach. Uh, it was, uh, they use it and it keeps things organized. But of course, SSIS and SSRS create their own GUID based names, which is always kind of funny too, as well. SQL Pilot subscribed at 30 months. 30 months straight. Woohoo! Love to see that. That's fantastic. Let's see. Next up, uh, Ignacio asks, in the database field, is deep or wide knowledge more valuable as a job seeker? Um, so this is a really interesting question. If you want to be very highly paid, you're going to want specific deep knowledge. That's where the really big money is, is the person who's extremely good at this one narrow task. And they get paid a boatload of money to do that one narrow task because nobody else knows it as, as deep as they do. And they can solve some really advanced problems. If you're applying for jobs from strangers and you're like desperate, then wide knowledge tends to be better. Just know that you have an income ceiling there because you're effectively competing every, with everyone who's a jack of all trades. Uh, DBA says, knowing your opinion on linked servers, what are use cases that you begrudgingly tolerate? Oh, I'll give you a couple of great ones. Um, so when you have an emergency and someone drops a table or someone does an uh, update that they're not supposed to without a where clause, whatever, the fastest way to recover from that is usually to restore the data onto a separate SQL server. I really don't want people restoring in production if we can avoid that, because I've seen so many instances where somebody accidentally overwrites the wrong database or we run out of drive space or whatever. Go restore in a development environment or QA, whatever, and then pipe across the data that you need in a linked server query. Generally, the easiest, excuse me, the easiest way to do that is to push from the development server or, of course, the, the other way you can do it is pull from the production server. Uh, but that is a one-time emergency thing. Totally makes sense, and I totally get behind that. Uh, next up, Miles says, could you give some advice uh, for introverts on how to network with people so that it'll genuinely help in one's career instead of having thousands of LinkedIn con con connects connections? <laughs> Blog and present. You can blog and be as introverted as you want. Blogging scales, like scales to very large numbers of readers. Shaking hands does not scale. Going in and meeting people for individual one-on-one -on -one meetings doesn't scale. It, it takes you forever to make 100 connections. If you blog, you can make 100 connections really quickly and easily. Blog. Do that instead. Uh, next up, Jokel asks, uh, Postgres now supports MySQL wire protocol. Oh, I had no idea. Uh, says, is it, is it inevitable that Postgres will do something similar for Oracle? So the, the problem uh, with trying to achieve wire compatibility is at the same time you're trying to catch up with whoever you're trying to be wire compatible with, the other platform is trying to race ahead and introduce new features. So when they introduce new features, you have to kind of reverse engineer and catch up to them. Things like that are, are never really going to succeed well with closed source databases where the maker has a, a profit incentive to outbuild you. Like, uh, I feel so sorry for anybody who tries to achieve wire compatibility with SQL servers always encrypted, for example. And then, uh, oh, let's see, we'll do a couple of the new questions that just came in. Uh, Gab poll says, uh, to fabric or not to fabric, is it worth exploring? If you're a data professional who works in BI, in business intelligence, um, and especially if you're a consultant who works in business intelligence, you kind of don't have a choice. You have to explore it because Microsoft has this squirrel philosophy where they keep renaming and rejuggling all their BI tools every two years. Um, so to stay vaguely current, you have to play Squirrel 2 and learn a bunch of stuff that's never going to stick around, and I feel sorry for you, and you should choose another career, but that's why I chose this one. Uh, next up, uh, Paul says, I always put declares at the head of my code because in VFP, 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 Visual Fox Pro, the SQL Server, Visual Fox Pro, what year is this? 
when you're learning something new that, and I knew it's new to you, SQL Server is new to you, kind of do yourself a favor and set aside technologies from the 1960s. I, I, Visual Fox Pro. Goodness. Um, and then we'll do one more. Let's see. Let's pick something interesting. Uh, oh, Nostradamus asks, uh, does parameter sniffing ever happen with large or with smaller tables or only larger tables? Oh, yeah, totally. Absolutely. It's all about distribution. If you have anything where data distribution is wildly different. Uh, the, and I demonstrated in the Stack Overflow database using the smallest table in the Stack Overflow database, the users table. Uh, and you can see it going all the way back to like the 2010 copy of Stack Overflow that's got like 200,000 rows in it. Absolutely. It happens with smaller tables. All right, there we go. So uh, there's a whole bunch of your questions answered. I'm actually going to clear the uh, uh, poll gab queue altogether uh, so that uh, we can have a new fresh batch when uh, people uh, ask stuff in there. Because um, uh, sometimes there'll be there are a lot of them that are pending out there for a while where uh, people. <laughs> Vernon King says a channel not playing Fallout 76. Am I? I'm I'm right there with you in that I adore when Fallout came out on uh, Amazon Prime. The show is amazing. The Fallout TV show is phenomenal. It is so good. Uh, even I binge watched that start to finish in I think two days. Um, and I loved it. It was, and I've never played a Fallout game. Never played it. I have no intention of playing it. Uh, but as soon as I finished the show, I was like, I want to go see and learn everything there is about Fallout. Like I was watching YouTube lore videos about every vault that was out there. I, I just completely loved it. I'll never play the games. It's just not, I'm not into fast paced shooter type things. I'm generally into slower paced stuff. True story. So the, the game that's on the home screen of my phone that I play continuously is a lawn mowing simulator lawn mowing simulator and it's called it's literally just mowing and i play this every day i'm on a streak for like uh 40 days or something uh where i have mowed like continuously and i don't know that i'm going to get a good shot of that uh but it is literally just lawn mowing and you go and mow lawns it's <laughs> sql to fdba says i have sql pressure washing simulator on oculus i love it that makes total sense pressure washing is the exact same kind of thing where you're just getting making these nice easy patterns and all that forest gum it's really like soothing and i'll play it on airplanes i think um I'll play it when Eve is like stuck in something shopping, you know, like trying clothes on or whatever. I've I've probably played that for a hundred hours easy, and I've like no end in sight. There's a Reddit, there's a subreddit group dedicated to mowing simulator. To it's literally just mowing. It's funny as hell. All right, so I am going to go. Uh, uh, <laughs> More says no joke. Our office taught crochet because it's redundant and pattern oriented. There are a lot of technical professor professionals who do knitting and crocheting. Um, I think the first one that I ever ran into was Donald Farmer, who used to run a lot of the business intelligence stuff at uh, Microsoft, and he's retired these days. But he makes socks, hats, uh, scarves, all kinds of stuff. His Instagram. Instagram's amusing. SQL Dev DBA says Taryn does uh, woodworking. Yeah, Taryn Pratt at uh, Microsoft, formerly of Stack Overflow, um, does beautiful woodworking. I have a bunch of her pieces. I have like two of her cutting boards uh, and several of her like bowls that sit on my uh, entryway. And I give them away for Christmas gifts every year too. So thanks for hanging out with me and I will see y'all at the next Office Hours. Adios.